This is a selection of poems written since the early 1940s. You have to step over everything. It's just a junk store now, completely. It's the man reading his own stuff that's so amazing. The absolutely characteristic rise and fall, a sort of eorish rise and fall. That Whitson, I was late getting away. Not till about 1.20 on the sunlit Saturday did my three-quarters empty train pull out. I thought well, they've been sitting here in this dank environment for years I uh, probably won't even play all of us carry around an archive of very ordinary things our photograph albums old record collections or letters and all of us dream of finding something extraordinary some rarity or lost treasure in our cellars and attics in February 2006 two reels of audio tape turned up in a junk filled garage in Hornsey on Humberside they contained recordings of the poet Philip Larkin reading 26 of his poems and they'd lain forgotten on a shelf for a quarter of a century. The first one is called Lines on a Young Lady's Photograph Album. At last you yielded up the album which, once open, sent me distracted. All your ages, matte and glossy on the thick black pages. Too much confectionery, too rich, I choke on such nutritious images. Well, I thought I knew what Larkin sounded like. I do know what Larkin sounds like. I have his voice in my head. But when I put it on and listened to it for the first time, I was astonished by the kind of impact that it had on me. I found it intensely moving. I mean, just leaving aside friendship, just as a, a sort of address to the human spirit, I find it very, very moving. Those flowers, that gate, these misty parks and motors... Lacerate simply by being over. You contract my heart by looking out of date. Yes, true, but in the end, surely, we cry not only at exclusion, but because it leaves us free to cry. We know what was when call on us to justify our grief. However hard we yowl across the gap from eye to page, so I am left to mourn without a chance of consequence, you, balanced on a bike against a fence, to wonder if you'd spot the theft of this one of you, bathing, to condense, in short, a past that no one now can share, no matter who's your future. Calm and dry, it holds you like a heaven, and you lie unvariably lovely there, smaller and clearer, as the years go by. These are magnificent poems which a lot of us have pretty much off by heart, but the ones that he's chosen to read on this, which are pretty much the best of the best, do make an astounding collection of, of noises, uh, to put it like that. Andrew Motion, Larkin's biographer. Not surprisingly, these noises caused quite a stir when they were discovered by the Weeks family in 2006. 21 minutes past eight. When the poet Philip Larkin died of throat cancer in 1985, it was believed that he'd never recorded any of the works from his first important collection, The North Ship. But now recordings of Larkin have been found in the attic of one of his friends. Now, Peter Weeks, you made a joke, didn't you, about um, putting the tapes on eBay. You're not serious, are you? Yeah, I, I spoke to a reporter from the Yorkshire Post and uh, made a joke that I would sell them on eBay. And uh, she put it in the uh, article on the front page, which... Um, it was just a joke. <laughs> <laughs> I think relief all round yeah, in the poetry community. Of all the poets you could auction off in cyberspace, thankfully, the Weeks family, who own the tapes, have given custody of them to Faber and Faber, Larkin's publishers. And this was the actual studio where you did your recording. And um, you sat in the store and signalled to John when he was ready, or John would signal to him, and off they go. <laughs> the tapes actually turned up in a garage that was once a makeshift studio built by Peter Weeks' father, John. A former BBC sound engineer, John Weeks had taken a job at Hull University's Audio Visual Centre and moved his family to the nearby seaside town of Hornsey. He had um, a garage that's attached to the, the side of the house, really. He divided that up so there was a control room area and a studio area. 
and um, he set himself up with uh, kit he had bought and um, stuff he had uh, salvaged from closed down studios and things and made a little studio where he did lots of local recordings, recordings for um, the Oral History Society and um, recordings of amateur dramatic programs and uh, stuff for Radio Humberside he did there, the, the stuff, the programs he did with my mother. Well, what have you all been doing since our last programme at Christmas? Those short reports that he made with his wife, Molly Weeks, were called About Humberside. We've changed the car from a blue to a white one, and instead of one white bull terrier sitting in state on the back seat, there's now the addition of five rascally puppies. But otherwise, we're much the same. John, who does all the hard work organising and recording the programme, and me, to make sure that he doesn't get a word in edgeways. Oh, and what do you think of our new signature tune? John Weeks' job at Hull University brought him into contact with Larkin, who was university librarian. They shared an occasional drink at Staff House and a love of jazz. Up until that point, Larkin's experiences of recording studios were pretty bad. Background noise, engineering blunders, and he likened conditions in one to the black hole of Calcutta. And so when the Yorkshire Arts Association made a recording with Larkin that he felt wasn't up to scratch, he asked John Weeks to step in and was quietly impressed with his work. After that, whenever Philip Larkin had to record something, he got my father to do it because he trusted him to uh, record the programme. In the late 1970s, Larkin was approached by an American publisher, the Watershed Foundation. They asked if he would record a selection of his poems for a series they were making of single poet tapes. And so Larkin made a private arrangement with John Weeks to record 26 at his Hornsey studio in February 1980. Oh, yes, they did it on a couple of Sundays. And John went into Hull to fetch him and took him back again. Each time they did a recording. Molly Weeks. They came out three times, but I think it was only two days they recorded. Well, I didn't really see them. They got on with it, and I made the coffee and staggered out there with it. <laughs> that was that. Um, physically, he was a very tall, big-built man, and John was six foot one, you know, so uh, I felt he was a bit intimidating. Hmm. The main problem with him, I think, was his thick glasses. He had these very thick, you know, the very thick kind, so that you couldn't really tell whether he was being serious or not from his eyes, as you can with most people. In the end, the publishing deal ran into difficulties, and the master tapes were shelved in the Weeks garage. Larkin died in 1985, John Weeks ten years later, and the tapes lay forgotten for 25 years. Right, now then... You have to step over everything, because it's just a junk store now, completely. We might never have heard them at all, had Molly and Peter not decided to have a bit of a clear-out. These are the shelves where he stores all his, uh, or stored all his tapes. So I knew that he had told me there was a, a Larkin tape out here, so one day I came and had a look, and Peter actually found it. I'd forgotten that it was an important tape that was there. Uh, well, then, so were uh, many others. Uh, there was Sooty and Sweep. He, he worked on the very early first Sooty and Sweeps. And then Pinky and Perky. He was the one that um, found the silly sound for them by playing it at double speed and then recording it at half that or something like that, you know. I can't remember, really. The tapes were stored in um, two boxes, uh, seven-inch reels of tape, quarter-inch tape. I thought well, they've been sitting here in this dank environment for years. I bet they don't sound very good at all. They probably won't even play. This is a selection of poems written since the early 1940s. The first one is called... But they did play, and these tapes are a real find. The sound quality is superb, and Larkin sounds relaxed and on form. When you consider how reluctant this poet famously was to perform in public and his distrust of the recording studio, the tapes take on an even greater significance. Listening to these tapes for the first time, I realised my own admiration for Larkin's work shows no sign of abating. It's now over 15 years since the publication of his biography and selected letters, 
which between them caused something of a kerfuffle. It seemed as though Britain's best-loved poet was also a misogynist and a racist. But it's good to think that the discovery of these tapes might turn the spotlight back onto the poetry again. They offer us a fresh look and a fresh listen, and the only known recordings of three poems from his first collection, The North Ship. We've also a chance to consider Larkin's awkward relationship with his own voice, and wonder why he chose the particular set list he did. Andrew Motion. To have what looks like a contents page um, is extremely valuable because it doesn't exist in any other form for various complicated contractual reasons. It wasn't possible for there to be a selected poems, and at various times it's quite clear that Larkin did want to have a book of poems which made a selection from the, the three, or possibly the four, canonical collections. The North Ship, the first one, which is full of much younger and rather different kinds of poems, but the three absolutely sort of canonical ones, The Less Deceived, Wisdom Weddings and, and High Windows. The trees. The trees are coming into leaf, like something almost being said. The recent buds relax and spread. Their greenness is a kind of grief. Is it that they are born again and we grow old? No, they die too. Their yearly trick of looking new is written down in rings of grain. Yet still the unresting castles fresh in full-grown thickness every May. Last year is dead, they seem to say. Begin afresh. Afresh, afresh. My impression, uh, just looking at the uh, list of titles, is that this does rather play up the more romantic, softer part of the Larkin spectrum. James Booth is head of English at Hull University. And here, interestingly, you don't have the more abrasive movement poems, masculine poems with uh, four-letter words, uh, effing and blinding poems. This be the verse isn't here. But you do have uh, life-affirming poems like Coming, uh, The Trees, which show, I think, his more romantic, emotional side. Larkin was famous for keeping his head down. And there's the rub. For a poet who shunned the spotlight, he stuck with a remarkably durable image the bicycle clips, the big glasses, a librarian wandering through an austere, black-and-white, post-war England. But Larkin lived until the mid-1980s. It's three minutes past four in Downing Street, thronged with people, and this is Thatcher, Britain's first ever woman prime minister. And when this recording was made, Margaret Thatcher was well into her first term of office. Too much, too young. February 1980, I was 14 and far more interested in some of Coventry's other sons, namely the specials. It was the era of the homemade cassette and at the other end of the M62 from Hull in Liverpool, I was busy making tapes of my own. Terry Hall singing about contraception, the welfare state and the generation gap. Not a million miles from what we might call typically Larkin-esque. Larkin was an enthusiastic tape maker too, making compilations of the jazz greats. He was 58 when he recorded this archive and couldn't have known he only had five years left. But by February 1980, many things seemed to be drawing to a close. His affair with Maeve Brennan was at an end. Many friends, including the novelist Barbara Pym, had recently died and he was still recovering from the loss of his mother three years earlier. Andrew Motion. It certainly is true to say that his life did change very significantly in all kinds of complicated ways after his mother's death. It was liberating in a way because he'd spent so much time looking after her, and even though he loved her, she drove him round the bend. But her death either actually triggered, or at least coincided with, the beginning of the last part of his life by which I mean the part of his life in which he pretty much didn't write poems anymore. He writes a handful of poems in the last few years of his life, in the last ten years of his life, in fact, and I think he definitely felt that it had left him. He said somewhere 
that it was a sorrow, but not a crushing sorrow. But it certainly did change his sense of himself in a very profound way. Paradoxically, while all this diminution of power, this leaking away of poems is going on, there's quite a marked acceleration in the trajectory of his rise to fame. And he's become the nation's favourite poet by a distance. So we've got this time of his life in which this recording is made is on the one hand very affirming to do with the rise of his reputation, the development of his reputation, but at the same time very darkly shadowed by losses of one kind or another. Afternoons. Summer is fading. The leaves fall in ones and twos from trees bordering the new recreation ground. In the hollows of afternoons, young mothers assemble at swing and sand pit, setting free their children. Behind them, at intervals, stand husbands in skilled trades, an estate full of washing, and the albums lettered Our Wedding lying near the television. Before them, the wind is ruining their courting places, that are still courting places, but the lovers are all in school, and their children, so intent on finding more unripe acorns, expect to be taken home. Their beauty has thickened. Something is pushing them to the side of their own lives. When these poems were recorded, Larkin was just about to mark 25 years at Hull University Library. He had compared the place to a Shetland pony when he'd first arrived in 1955. But by the time these tapes were made in 1980, it had grown into a frightful grand national winner. The Hermit of Hull was also a busy man, responsible for a large staff, but then Larkin is full of ambiguities. The poet Cecil Day-Lewis and the actress Jill Balkan knew Larkin well. I saw him in Hull when I went up there because my husband had the Compton chair at Hull University and they became great friends when, when Cecil was like a sort of visiting professor if you like it wasn't he wasn't there all the time in term time and they used to drink together and meet and <laughs> I always remember somebody this is not my phrase but a friend who'd been a don at Hull at one point said my image of Philip is standing by the bus stop in a cashmere coat on a rainy day. <laughs> he was very immaculately dressed. It's another surprise for people who think that all poets are scruffy. He was beautifully turned out. Back in 1955, when Larkin first arrived at Hull University, his worry wasn't whether he'd stay, but what the interview panel would make of his poem, Toads. Why should I let the toad work squat on my life? Can't I use my wit as a pitchfork and drive the brute off? Six days of the week it soils with its sickening poison. Just for paying a few bills, that's out of proportion. Lots of folk live on their wits. Lecturers, lispers, lozels, loblolly men, louts. They don't end as paupers. Lots of folk live up lanes with fires in a bucket, eat windfalls and tin sardines. They seem to like it. Their nippers have got bare feet, their unspeakable wives are skinny as whippets, and yet no one actually starves. Ah, were I courageous enough to shout, stuff your pension. But I know all too well that's the stuff that dreams are made on. For something sufficiently toad-like squats in me, too. Its hunkers are heavy as hard luck and cold as snow and will never allow me to blarney my way to getting the fame and the girl and the money all at one sitting. I don't say one bodies the other one's spiritual truth, but I do say it's hard to lose either when you have both. Moving to Hull, meant Larkin lived close to George and Jean Hartley, who ran the Marvell Press. They were about to publish his breakthrough collection, The Less Deceived, and so got to know one another well. Jean Hartley 
saw another side of Larkin. Well, his his reading voice for for the poems is is quite grave and serious most of the time, but in fact he was the funniest man I knew, and his great delight was to make his friends laugh. And whenever he came to see us, which in the early days was once a week at the weekend, he'd regale us with all that had happened to him during the week. He'd be able to mimic all the voices of his colleagues. And his face, too, was one of those India rubber faces that would turn itself into anyone at all. Even the Queen Mother, <laughs> when she came, he had a, a lovely anecdote about the Queen Mother being introduced to him by the Vice-Chancellor and Vice-Chancellor saying, and this is Mr Larkin, our poet librarian, and her saying, oh, what a lovely thing to be. <laughs> Which he did beautifully, of course. <laughs> Mr. Bleeny. This was Mr. Bleeny's room. He stayed the whole time he was at the bodies till they moved him. Flowered curtains, thin and frayed, fall to within five inches of the sill, whose window shows a strip of building land, tussocky, littered. Mr. Bleeny took my bit of garden properly in hand. Bed, upright chair, 60-watt bulb, no hook behind the door, no room for books or bags. I'll take it. So it happens that I lie where Mr. Bleeny lay and stub my fags on the same saucer souvenir and try stuffing my ears with cotton wool to drown the jabbering set he egged her on to buy. I know his habits, what time he came down, his preference for sauce to gravy, why he kept on plugging at the four of ways. Likewise, their early frame, the Frinton folk who put him up for summer holidays, and Christmas at his sister's house in Stoke. But if he stood and watched the frigid wind tousling the clouds, lay on the fusty bed, telling himself that this was home, and grinned and shivered, without shaking off the dread that how we live measures our own nature, and at his age, having no more to show than one hired box should make him pretty sure he warranted no better, I don't know. I think he is the best person to read his own work. James Booth. Because he reads it so naturally. As he said in, at the beginning of one of his workbooks, he wrote, these poems are to be read on the page. However, if the occasion should arise that they are to be read out loud in company, I would prefer them to be read in a straightforward way, as though giving directions to someone in the street. Now, that is exactly right. He puts all the rhetoric, he puts all the performativeness into the actual structure of the words. It enacts itself. And so to um, put on a, a, a great tone, as Yeats did, or Tennyson did, uh, he would have thought to completely wrong. The characteristic intonation, I think, is rise and fall, a sort of eorish rise and fall, and that, that's, of course, exactly what the poems do at, at the level of meaning, too. What they do is to make an address to something and then qualify it or back off from it. I mean, that is actually the sound that he makes when he's reading these words. An Arundel tomb. Side by side, their faces blurred, the Earl and Countess lie in stone, their proper habits vaguely shown as jointed armour stiffened pleat, and that faint hint of the absurd, the little dogs under their feet. You can hear from those opening lines to an Arundel tomb how at ease Larkin must have felt in John Weeks's garage studio. This wasn't always the case. Larkin was very self-conscious about what he called his plummy, dead fish speaking voice. He also had a stammer, and remembered how, as a boy, his words jerkingly came gasping out uttered in the strangled, high-pitched nasal voice of a seaside marionette. Andrew Motion. 
I think his reluctance to give public readings and to become a public figure does have something to do with the fact that he doubted his own voice in the sense that he had a very bad stammer when he was a child and this was cured by a man who taught him to swallow it. Now, interestingly, in the earlier recordings that we have of him, you can hear him making what he himself used to refer to as a bushman's click from time to time. You can actually hear him swallowing that stammer, that noise. Oliver's Riverside Blues, it was. And now I shall, I suppose, always remember how the flock of notes those antique Negroes blew out of Chicago air into a huge remembering pre-electric horn the year after I was born, three decades later, made this sudden bridge from your unsatisfactory age to my unsatisfactory prime. When a person cured his stammer by teaching him to sort of swallow the word, swallow the stammer before he delivered it, resulting in this Bushman's click, as he used to call it. It occurred to me later, this is the thing I most regret not having put in my biography because I didn't think about it until later. He also, in some sense, gave him his voice. I met Larkin's sister a few times who outlived him by a few years to talk to her about their childhood together. And she had, as Philip would have done when he was a little boy, a quite thick Coventry accent. I mean, she put a, a G on the end of the word chicken, for instance. Chicking. And that's how Larkin would have spoken when he, when he was a little boy. Well, this man who gave him a voice gave him really a kind of RP voice, which was very much not his sister's. And what I think, my idea, unprovable, of course, but it is worth thinking about, I, I think, is the extent to which the voice that Larkin was given by the person who cured him of his stammer did precisely come with, with a set of aspirations and expectations and even limitations, too, that in some quite profound sense, set him on the, the course that his, the rest of his life then followed. Losing his Midlands accent mightn't have bothered Larkin. He said he came from Coventry, between the sloppiness of Leicester and the wine of Birmingham. Jean Hartley. I think Philip was uh, worried in case his traces of brummy accent <laughs> emerged but um, I could never hear it. It just sounded like a posh voice to me with my northern voice. But I think he felt insecure about just about everything. What is the proper accent for reading a poem? Things were very different for writers of Larkin's generation to my own. But for Larkin, speech and accent weren't the only problems. Well, late in life, he did say that his, the first half of his life had been ruined by the fact that he had a stammer and so couldn't speak. And the second half of his life was ruined by the fact he was deaf and so couldn't hear. And he made a joke out of that. You know, here am I, I suppose, master of communication. And I've been disabled in two different ways across my lifespan. John Osborne of Hull University. He first realised that he was going stone deaf when he ceased to be able to hear bird song, And, of course, that did leave him feeling somewhat bereft because he particularly liked bird song. And there is a little motif that runs through his poems from start to finish that is to do with birdsong. In the poem Coming, the repeated line, it will be spring soon, it will be spring soon, is said by Larkin to be an attempt to mimic the repetitions of birdsong as well as the sort of hopeful message of the birds. So when he lost that, and I think it probably brought him intimations that he might lose his beloved jazz further down the line, I think he really did start to feel cut off and isolated and in some ways turned in on himself. Coming. On longer evenings, light, chill and yellow, bathes the serene foreheads of houses. A thrush sings, laurel surrounded in the deep bare garden its fresh peeled voice astonishing the brickwork. It will be spring soon. It will be spring soon. And I, whose childhood is a forgotten boredom, feel like a child who comes on a scene of adult reconciling and can understand nothing but the unusual laughter and starts to be happy. 
He had hearing aids that were supplied by a man called Raymond Cass, who was his hearing aid doctor in the last part of his life. There was quite often a good deal of feedback when he was talking, and it was until you knew him well enough to deal with it. It was embarrassing because he couldn't hear the feedback, so somebody had to tell him. I mean, for friends, you could just say, Philip, you're whining. And he'd say, oh, sorry, and, and deal with it, you know, twid twiddle with it. I think it was one of the last things added to a pretty long catalogue of bodily afflictions which made him have a dim view of himself as a physical entity. Stammering as a child, he always used to go on about how his back was too long in, in relation to the size of his, to the length of his legs. It made him useful in the scrum at school, I can remember him saying, but I mean, that was about it. It made him feel unhappy in his body. He lost his hair quite early on. He minded about that. And he took great care of his hair when he was a younger man. We can see that in the pictures. He's forever sort of brill creaming it and arranging it in, in some way or other. And his eyesight wasn't good. Certainly not good enough for him to fight in the war, for instance. Um, and put on a lot of weight. And there's a lot of grumbling in the letters about, about putting on weight and having to go and shop in High and Mighty, where the range of things he could buy were nothing like the range that he wanted to be able to choose from. But actually, of course, what happens is that all these afflictions in themselves comparatively minor, do amount collectively to quite a major thing and make him feel that he'd better keep himself to himself. And it certainly has a big effect on, on his sense of what's possible in public life, too. Andrew Motion. Robert Lowell once described Larkin as six foot one, bald, death brooding, a sculptured statue of his poems. More recently, a critic compared his voice to a clinically depressed I speak your weight machine. This kind of thing isn't going to encourage anybody onto the stage. In fact, he didn't read in public until 1974, and had to be persuaded then by John Betjeman. Larkin was in the audience at the BBC Poetry Prom, a showcase for his Oxford book of 20th century English verse. I wonder if I can possibly persuade dear Philip Larkin, who's here, to read what is to me the greatest of recent poems, The Wits and Weddings, about Hull, that glorious and unregarded city, that Bristol of the East Coast. Jill Balkan was one of the readers. The concert hall in Broadcasting House was packed. I'm not suggesting that, uh, that we were such a draw, though John Betjeman, of course, always was a draw, but it was free, and it was always full. And I should think he was daunted by the size of the audience, yes. Philip was not a performer, but I think John Betjeman, he would have made Philip as comfortable as it was possible. Philip has come here on that journey which he's made so famous. And it shows you, the poem, how you come round curving along in the train from Hull Paragon through the little towns, through Ghoul, and change at Donk, or you don't have to if you're lucky, and it goes <laughs> straight down into King's Cross. Can you read it, Philip? I think I should warn you that this is the first time I've ever read a poem in, in public. And if I have any say in the matter, it will be the last. <laughs> that Whitson, I was late getting away. Not till about 1.20 on the sunlit Saturday did my three-quarters empty train pull out, all windows down, all cushions hot, all sense of being in a hurry gone. We ran behind the back. All sense of being in a hurry gone. We ran behind the backs of houses, crossed the street of blinding windscreens, smelt the fish dock, then the river's level drifting breadth began, where sky and Lincolnshire and water meet. All afternoon, through the tall heat that slept for miles inland, a slow and stopping curve southwards we kept. 
wide farms went by, short-shadowed cattle, and canals with floatings of industrial froth. A hothouse flashed uniquely, hedges dipped and rose, and now and then the smell of grass displaced the reek of buttoned carriage cloth until the next town, new and nondescript, approached with acres of dismantled cars. At first, I didn't notice what a noise the weddings made each station that we stopped at. Sun destroys the interest of what's happening in the shade, and down the long, cool platforms, whoops and skirls, I took for porters, larking with the males, and went on reading. Once we started, though, we passed them, grinning and pomaded, girls in parodies of fashion, heels and veils, all posed irresolutely, watching us go, as if out on the end of an event, waving goodbye to something that survived it. Struck, I leant more promptly out next time, more curiously, and saw it all again in, in different terms. The fathers with broad belts under their suits and seamy foreheads, mothers loud and fat, an uncle shouting smut, and then the perms, the nylon gloves and jewellery substitutes, the lemons, mauves and olive ochres that marked off the girls unreally from the rest. Yes, from cafes and banquet halls up yards and bunting-dressed coach party annexes, the wedding days were coming to an end. All down the line, fresh couples climbed aboard. The rest stood round. The last confetti and advice were thrown. And, as we moved, each face seemed to define just what it saw departing. Children frowned at something dull. Fathers had never known success so huge and wholly farcical. The women shared the secret like a happy funeral, while girls, gripping their handbags tighter, stared at a religious wounding. Free at last, and loaded with the sum of all they saw, we hurried towards London, shuffling gouts of steam. Now fields were building plots, and poplars cast long shadows over major roads, and for some fifty minutes, that in time would seem just long enough to settle hats and say, I nearly died, a dozen marriages got under way. They watched the landscape, sitting side by side, an Odeon went past, a cooling tower, and someone running up to bowl, and none thought of the others they would never meet, or how their lives would all contain this hour. I thought of London, spread out in the sun, its postal districts packed like squares of wheat. There we were aimed. And as we raced across bright knots of rail past standing pullmans, walls of blackened moss came close, and it was nearly done this frail travelling coincidence, and what it held stood ready to be loosed with all the power that being changed can give. We slowed again, and as the tightened brakes took hold, there swelled a sense of falling, like an arrow shower sent out of sight, somewhere becoming rain. A year after the poetry prom, Ted Hughes came to read at Hull. Larkin's insecurities about public performance find an outlet in the way he defines himself as opposite to Hughes. James Booth. In that um, extraordinary photograph that so many people know of him sitting rather sphinx-like at a desk in the Middleton Hall in Hull in 1975 with... Ted Hughes standing alongside him in his black leather jacket, delivering forth to all the girls in the audience, <laughs> hanging on his every word. Uh, there's a distinct tone of envy about that. He, he did say afterwards, they're advertising, meet Ted Hughes, 12 and sixpence. Uh, I felt I should walk around with a placard outside saying, meet Philip Larkin, three and sixpence. <laughs> 
Uh, so there's a kind of envy there, and it is an envy of the, the ability to perform, the ability to project. I think he knew that had he not been set back with the stammer and a lot of social inhibitions which go with that in public speaking, he would have been a natural performer, and I think he knew that, and he was rather disappointed that he'd never managed to do it. If you read what he says about it in his interviews, there's a definite undertone there, I think. Larkin was just as ambivalent about the early requests to record his voice. But after the success of The Less Deceived, George Hartley saw an opportunity for his Marvel press and was keen to capture Larkin on LP. Ah, oh, well, in 1958, George asked Philip if he would record The Less Deceived. Gene Hartley. And at first, Philip was really unwilling to. I don't read and... I'm a poor reader, and certainly not. And um, George, being persistent, kept on at him and, and lured him with the promise of a beautiful sleeve, a lovely photograph in the Springbank Cemetery, which was one of his favourite places. And that really persuaded him. And George wanted the best, and so he decided on HMV which turned out to be not the best, actually. It turned out to be very noisy, and, and Philip reckoned it was lavatory chain noises and people running up and down stairs and was quite disgruntled by it. But it came out and it was well received, mostly, although one critic said, his voice colourless as tap water, <laughs> which we thought hilarious. I'm not sure he'd have minded that colourless as tap water. Tap water is, or should be, clear and neutral and familiar. But if you get a little closer to your wireless, you can just about hear those noises off that so peeved Larkin in that HMV studio. Going. There is an evening coming in across the fields, one never seen before, that lights no lamps. Silken, it seems, at a distance, yet when it is drawn up over the knees and breast, it brings no comfort. Where has the tree gone that locked earth to the sky? What is under my hands that I cannot feel? What loads my hands down? Larkin and his contemporaries were writing during a boom in spoken word recordings. Poets were starting to make records. New things were possible. And after initial suspicion, Larkin did give the matter some serious thought. Ah, oh, so this is a, a passage from Larkin's required writing. The most interesting production in this field lately is Donald Davies' A Sequence for Francis Parkman. Here, the publisher, Mr George Hartley, has taken Mr Wayne at his word and produced a new kind of book. He offers, in conventional printed form, a sequence of seven new poems by Dr. Davy, but in addition he includes in a pocket in the back flap a seven-inch LP, yes, 33 and a third RPM, of the author reading them. This has never been done before, to my knowledge, and I therefore salute a landmark in publishing history. Its only drawback as a medium for publishing new verse is that at present it seems to get sent to the hack that does the records instead of the distinguished critic who notices poetry. <laughs> that was delightful, isn't it? I've forgotten that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Larkin suffered the studio often enough to mean that there are several versions of his poems. But these newly discovered tapes are unique because they contain the only known recordings of three early poems published in his collection, The North Ship. Anthony Thwaite, who championed Larkin's work on BBC Radio, asked him how he felt about The North Ship in a programme in the series New Comment in 1961. You began writing poetry pretty early, didn't you? At least I know there was a, there was a first book of poems called The North Ship, which was published in 1945. Oh, no. And in that book, I would say the, the hand of, of Yeats is pretty strongly apparent. Do you completely disown these early poems? I disown a good many of them, I must confess. One or two still strike me as being quite nicely turned. 
Uh, I did have a very strong Yates period, about 1944 to 46, probably due to my meeting Van Watkins, who who introduced me to the work of Yeats and who gave my own ideas about poetry a very strong impulse forwards. But the poems in, in the North Ship that I can still take now are more the colloquial ones where a quite simple idea is worked out in everyday language. The Yeatsian ones, I'm afraid, rather make my flesh creep. This is poem 10 from a collection called the North Ship. Within the dream you said, let us kiss then, in this room, in this bed. But when all's done, we must not meet again. Hearing this last word, there was no lemming night, no gale-driven bird, nor frost-encircled root as cold as my heart. Well, I think Philip's attitude to the poems in the North Ship was highly ambiguous. On one hand, he's very quick to admit that they are, and he's right, soaked in Yeats to the point at which you can't really see their true, the colours of his true personality. On the other hand, he never pushes them out of the frame entirely, and there are quite a lot of examples of how he grants permission for them to appear in anthologies. And here we have three of them chosen out of 26. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not nothing. mystery. But they certainly are true thematically. We have a poem about rejected love. We have a poem about not being able to love properly. And we have another poem which sort of combines those things and adds a bit more of the same. Now these we think of as being absolutely characteristic Larkin themes. So it's like hearing the real Larkin in terms of sensibility and apprehension of the world put through a filter of early Yeats. Poem number 13 from The North Ship. I put my mouth close to running water. Flow north, flow south. It will not matter. It is not love you will find. I told the wind. It took away my words. It is not love you will find. Only the bright-tongued birds. Only a moon with no home. It is not love you will find. You have no limbs crying for stillness. You have no mind trembling with seraphim. You have no death to come. So why do we continue to collectively care about Larkin's work? And why are some tapes turning up in a Humberside garage a big deal? Well, I think Larkin is an absolutely wonderful reader of his own poems. The Booker Prize winning author, John Banville, listens to the tapes for the first time. He's understated. Uh, he's always witty. I mean, I think one of the things that's, that's overlooked about Larkin is that he's the funniest poet ever. Um, one does laugh out loud at some of the poems, like Mr. Blini. I think these are, these are wonderfully funny. And Larkin's wonderfully deep, lugubrious voice does add to that. Uh, the thing that I found most interesting and most moving, really, was that he includes three poems from the North Ship which was very badly received at the time, was dismissed by the critics, and which I thought that Locke himself had disowned. But here are three of the poems in that. And it's fascinating and moving to listen to the way he reads them, because I don't think it's just youth revisited. I don't think it's nostalgia. I think he does like and value these poems. But one short lyric from the collection, High Windows, stands out. Larkin was never afraid of working on a small scale. I think he did agree with his friend Kingsley Amos that uh, more is less. And Cut Grass, which is a, a tiny poem, but I do think it is one of the greatest poems in the language. It says so much in such a tiny space. It's about happiness, it's about summer, it's about loss, it's about death, it's about the transience of things. And so beautifully modulated... And when you hear Larkin read Cutgrass, you can hear 
how much he loves this poem. He doesn't linger over it. He doesn't sob and sigh over it. He just reads it very calmly and clearly as he does all his poems. But you can see that he knows just how good it is. Cut grass lies frail. Brief is the breath moan stalks exhale. Long, long the death it dies in the white hours of young leafed June. With chestnut flowers, with hedges snow like strewn, white lilac bowed, lost lanes of Queen Anne's lace, and that high builded cloud moving at summer's pace. Larkin's work was often seen as great, but somehow or other the end of a tradition. John Osborne. The end, for instance, of a tradition of writing in regular metres, strict rhyme and that sort of thing. But actually, this is wrong. It seems to me that writing at the end of the 20th century and early in the 21st century, if anything, is more likely to allude to Larkin in a way that expresses indebtedness than to any other writer from the second half of the previous century. So, for instance, there's a huge crop of novels by really the most exciting novelists around that in one way or another nod back to Larkin as if to say thanks. Zadie Smith's On Beauty, for instance, does. John Banville's The Sea does. An extraordinary number of novels by Ian McEwan, including On Chesil Beach, the latest. They do. And perhaps the man who started it all was Julian Barnes, whose first three novels, they quote Larkin all the time, and in an admiring referential way, as if to say, I can take my bearings from him. Larkin is one of those writers who can get under your skin, and his influence extends way beyond literature. Traces of this establishment square can be found all over popular culture, from Damien Hirst to Radiohead. Larkin, who saw himself as something of an outsider, mightn't have been so surprised. Some people argue, of course, that in the age of the iPod and downloads that really textual culture may be that which is most under threat. So a textual culture which we also have on oral record may well offer the future ways of accessing that material which are the more likely to survive for being in recorded form. It's tremendously important, I think, not having a recording of D.H. Lawrence reading Snake is a great tragedy. There's no recording of D.H. Lawrence's prose or poetry. What a terrible, awful catastrophe. Uh, so easily remedied. I think one needs to know nowadays what a poet sounds like as well as what a poet reads. In creating this archive of 26 poems with sound engineer John Weeks, we can say that Larkin wanted his voice to be heard, and widely too. But he was more than aware of how complicated his relationship was to that voice and his sense of public persona. How would Larkin have fared today in a world of profile building and image management? Catherine Gray, a Larkin fan and poet at large now. I don't think in today's age Larkin could have taken the position that he did. To be a strong performer in poetry is absolutely key. Your work will be largely ignored unless you're promoting yourself. If you perform well, you sell lots of books. So who you are and how you present it is often actually more important than what you're actually doing. And in fact, I have done readings where I've actually been told, we'll have you back, you read really well, but no emphasis on the content. There's a real expectation on a poet. They are not just having to create work that is both reflective and challenging, but at the same time, they're having to worry constantly about the survival of that work in their own time, let alone for posterity. Side by side, their faces blurred, the Earl and Countess lie in stone, their proper habits vaguely shown as jointed armour, stiffened pleat, and that faint hint of the absurd, the little dogs under their feet. Such plainness of the pre-baroque hardly involves the eye until it meets his left-hand gauntlet still clasped empty in the other and one sees with a sharp, tender shock 
his hand withdrawn, holding her hand. They would not think to lie so long. Such faithfulness in effigy was just a detail friends would see, a sculptor's sweet commissioned grace thrown off in helping to prolong the Latin names around the base. They would not guess how early in their supine stationary voyage the air would change to soundless damage, turn the old tenantry away. How soon succeeding eyes begin to look, not to read. Rigidly they persisted, linked through lengths and breadths of time. Snow fell, undated. Light each summer thronged the glass. A bright slitter of bird calls strewed the same bone-riddled ground. And up the paths, the endless altered people came, washing at their identity. Now, helpless in the hollow of an unarmorial age, a trough of smoke in slow suspended skeins above their scrap of history, only an attitude remains. Time has transfigured them into untruth. The stone fidelity they hardly bent has come to be their final blazon and to prove our almost instinct almost true. What will survive of us is love. It's something that my father did. I know it's it's um, mostly Philip Larkin, but there is some of my father's work in there as well. And it's a little monument to him after his death. I only wish I had the bits he'd cut out. They'd be quite interesting. The Archive Hour was presented by Paul Farley. The publishers, Faber.